Men's Ministry Facebook group. There were several people that asked me that couldn't be here, so if you happen to miss a week, I'm going to try to do that every week, um, and I'm going to for sure need this microphone. sit here and not walk around? I don't know. Well, I was trying to decide if I was going to walk around or just sit here the whole time. I don't know. We'll see. Okay, i got to be able to see my notes, though, y'all. For those of you that I've never met, I'm Candace Crabtree, not Candace, Candace Prophet. <laughs> we each get texts and messages for each other. Many, many moons ago, when we were both pregnant with our first babies, we taught at Piedmont, Piedmont Elementary together, so we've had a lot of years of knowing each other, but I am so excited that you're here. I am so excited that there are so many women that want to just open the word together, um, but y'all, I'm nervous, so you can pray for me. I spent a lifetime teaching children in various capacities, public school, private school, homeschooling, piano lessons, but teaching a room full of your peers and women that you just admire and just the godliest of women sitting in front of me, it's way more intimidating than teaching a five-year-old how to read. So um, I, I've got my notes and I'm going to try to stick to them. I also typed this out, and I have no idea. I might get through it in five minutes, and may, we may be ready to go, or it may take me a while. I don't know. But I, I'm not a Bible scholar or anything, but I've been walking with the Lord for more than 30 years now, and every year I just love his word more and more. And he has met me every time I open it, every time I open it, all these years later. And I've read Philippians I don't know how many times. But as I was studying for this, the Lord still was continuing to teach me and show me new things in his word. And he meets me in my dark moments. He meets me when I don't know what to pray. He meets me in his word. And so it is my, just my heart here that we would just all be open and surrender to what he wants to prayerfully just teach us. And um, I, I had to tell myself that his word is what holds the power. There's nothing I can say. You know, I'm just a little vessel sitting here, who a girl who likes to read her Bible, and um, I love his word, but it's, it's his word that holds the power. Nothing I can say holds any power. So if I say the wrong thing or if I get some fact wrong, You'll forgive me, I'm sure. Um, but his word also, we're, we're told in Isaiah that his word doesn't return void. So I know that your time here tonight, um, he's, going to, he's going to teach you something if you're ready for it. He's going to encourage you or comfort you or teach you something new about himself. Um, I enjoyed learning a little bit more about Paul this time around as I was studying. And so I'm just going to kind of pretend we're on my front porch. If you, if you follow me on social media, I, I like to sit on my front porch with my cup of coffee in the morning. So I'm just going to pretend you're sitting in that chair next to me, and we're just chatting about the book of Philippians. And um, so we're going to dig in together. A brief outline of just our summer together. Tonight, we're going to try and talk about a little bit of background to the book of Philippians and also chapter 1. Then the next week that we meet, we're going to try and cover chapters 2 and 3. And then the last week, we're going to cover chapter 4 together. So you don't have an official workbook. What's wrong? <laughs> Are the printed sheets up there? I'm, I'll pass them out in just a minute. Okay. Or I'll, I'll, and I don't think I have enough, but I'll bring more next week. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. I was going to explain it first. Um, there's no workbook or anything to... To, to this study, but I am going to show you some books that I've used and that I've enjoyed in case you would like to dig deeper on your own. Um, but I am going to give you some homework, and this homework is all dependent upon just your time and your season of life. If you've got, if you've got little ones, you may not be able to do this, but one time, but if you have more time to sit this summer and spend in God's Word, I'm going to encourage you to read through the entire book of Philippians as many times as you can. When I am studying a book of the Bible, read it through in its entirety. It's four chapters. I think it's 104 verses. So it's not one of the longest books of the Bible, but you're going to get a bigger picture of this letter. You know, it's a letter. It wasn't written as a book or like 
a theological study guide. It was, it was a letter to, to friends. So read it through in its entirety. You know, every time you sit down with your Bible or read one chapter a day, try to read through it several times through in its entirety. And the other thing I like to do is write the word. So if you, there's 104 verses, if you just want to do that the next six weeks and write two verses a day, you could get through that in the summer. Get out a journal, just a plain notebook, and literally write down two or three verses from the book each time. What do we write down? We write down things that are important. We write down things that we want to remember. Um, I do online studies on Instagram, and we went through Philippians in April, May, something. And I had a schedule, and somebody messaged me, and she said, you know, I am seeing things through writing it that I never saw before. It's like it triggers something different in your brain, the way your brain works when you write it as opposed to just reading it. So that's something else I like to do. And then my last suggestion, these are just suggestions if you want to take it deeper on your own. My last suggestion, after you've read through Philippians one time, find a passage that stuck out to you and me memorize it this summer. Hiding God's word in our hearts is so very powerful. And um, the Lord will use that in ways you don't even know. He may use it five years from now and when he brings to mind a verse that you've memorized. So those are my three suggestions for you if you want to dig deeper, um, is read the whole thing, write the word, and then memorize the word. Choose one passage to focus on. That's something that jumps out at you, something that's personal to you from the book when you've read it. So before I study a book of the Bible, I like to look at a little bit of the background of the book, like who wrote it, who did he write it to? Why did he write it? And these things all help give us a perspective of the verses that we're going to read. Some of the phrases will jump out at you in a new way when you think, oh my goodness, he wrote this then or to them or whatever. It just it brings new light to the book of the Bible when we know the why behind it. So I'm sure a lot of this you're already familiar with, but I love to just refresh my memory um, so Philippians was a letter that Paul wrote, and who did he write it to? He wrote it to the church in Philippi. So he wrote it roughly, they think, around 62 AD, which was 12 years after the church at Philippi began. And so Paul, you know, started this church, and something interesting I learned this time around is you can, if you want to read about the start of the church at Philippi, you can go to Acts chapter 16, and you can read all about the very first people in this church, Lydia, you've probably heard Lydia, the, um, the jail keeper that he converted, the demon-possessed girl, these were all the very first, the founding members of the church at Philippi. Um, so um, Paul was a Roman citizen, he was trained as a Pharisee, he was also known as Saul, I'm sure you know. He persecuted Christians, y'all, persecuted Christians, and then wrote more than any other, more books of the Bible than anybody else. Um, he converted to Christianity on the road to Damascus, which you can find in Acts 9. He preached Christ faithfully on three different missionary journeys. He wrote letters to those churches. So he would go on these missionary journeys, and then later he would write these letters, like the book of Philippians was a letter back to that church that he had visited uh, and started. Um, so he wrote 13 books of the Bible. He worked as a tent maker to support his missionary journey, and he was remembered as the greatest missionary of all time. Then, um, so the letter was written to believers um, in Philippi, the church in Philippi, around 61 AD, AD from one of Paul's imprisonments in Rome. And he also mentions Timothy in the, in the greeting. We're going to get to that in a minute. He mentions Timothy um, and that they are sending the letter together uh, to the church at Philippi. And he was with, Timothy was with um, Paul when that church began. And he knew those people. And so it was, he was probably... Um, What's it called when you, uh, Paul probably dictated. It wasn't necessarily probably co-authored by Timothy, but it was probably more likely that Paul would like dictate it and Timothy was, you know, writing the letter out. This um, is known as the book of joy. 
So um, I think something like 16 times uh, the word joy or rejoice is found in this book. And that's, so that's one of the major themes. If you're looking at the theme of the book of Philippians, one of the major themes is joy. And I, just this fact alone that he writes so much about joy is so challenging and convicting to me because do you know where Paul was when he wrote this letter? He was imprisoned, which at that time meant it was probably a home prison. I don't know who's home. But he was, he was chained, likely, to the guard at all times. So here he is with his, he's in prison because of his faith. And he's writing to these precious people that he loves about joy. I don't know about you, but that is very, very convicting to me. So um, I just am imagining, you know, writing a letter from jail. If I was in jail and writing a letter to my friends, I don't think it would be about rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. I don't know. So that's very, that's amazing to me. So there are three main reasons that Paul wrote this letter to the church at Philippi. First, he wanted to thank them for their financial support. So, you know, he took, just like we support missionaries today, he needed support to continue on his journeys. And the church at Philippi, the people there were one of his financial supports. He wanted to warn them of the enemy at hand, and then he wanted to encourage them. He wrote a lot about joy. So I am, we're going to, We'll go ahead and do this. Um, this chart comes from this book. So when I when I told Michael Turner I was we were studying Philippians, he said you have to get this book. And actually, I think it might be out of print, so they loaned me theirs. But if you can find a used copy or something, it's called Laugh Again by Charles Swindoll. There's a Bible study guide, and then there's a book that looks just like this. But this Bible study guide, I love it, you guys. It is so good. And this chart was taken from there. So I'm going to pass one out. And if there's not enough, then I will get more copies made next week. Sure. Um, so on this chart, he, um, he breaks down the chapters and talks about um, different things to find, different, different aspects of joy. He breaks down joy in the different chapters um, of this book. So he talks about Chapter 1, finding joy in living, with Jesus being our life. Chapter 2, finding joy in serving, and Jesus being our model for serving. Chapter 3, joy in sharing, and sharing the gospel. And then chapter 4, joy in resting, Jesus being our contentment and our peace. So, um, the other, so that's one book that I've enjoyed, and then there's another book, it's called Conversational Commentary on Philippians, um, and it's just, it's really just a commentary, it goes verse by verse, and then it also has some, like, discussion questions. The author is Michelle Myers, so I've also enjoyed that one, too, if you're looking for a bit. So that, that chart is just something you can take and look at, I used, a, I used some of the information from this book and that, that uh, I just thought that was a neat way to look at the book of Philippians. I've never seen it broken down like that. And so I thought y'all might like to have a copy of it too. Okay, and now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna kinda go verse by verse. We're not gonna hit every, I could, you know, we could probably talk for a year if I was gonna talk about every phrase in this book that is, you know, powerful or meaningful to me or whatever, but. We're just going to kind of skip through and hit the highlights of chapter 1 tonight. So the opening verse says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the opening gives us a greeting from Paul and Timothy, and he's giving thanksgiving for the believers in Philippi, and then a prayer. And this is very similar if you've read other of his letters it's very similar to how he opens all of his letters. So in most ancient letters, um, the authors and re recipients are noted at the beginning. So that he just, he's like introducing, saying, this is me, Paul, writing to you, church at um, Philippi. Um, so we know Paul and Timothy had a close relationship, almost like a father and son. He calls himself a spiritual son. 
in the Lord and a mentorship. Um, and Timothy had joined Paul on his missionary journey to Philippi. And as I said earlier, he probably was dictating as Paul was telling him what to write or whatever. Um, so then let's look at, then he goes on to thank them. I love verse three. I thank my God in all my remembrances of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Um, now this next verse is probably one of the most encouraging verses in the whole entire Bible. Is this anybody's favorite verse? <laughs> he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. I don't know about you, but I, um, you know, I wake up a lot at night and I think I've messed up one too many times. I've said the wrong thing. I'm too far gone. Um, even battling the enemy with thoughts about tonight, like, why? Well, who am I to say? I just sit here and, you know, um, just the lies from the enemy. But this verse tells us that he's going to finish what he started in you and you and you and you and you. And not only is he going to finish what he started, but he's going to finish the good work that he started. It's a good work. It's a good work. And we may mess it up. We may stumble and fall, and we're going to mess up. But he is going to finish. And I don't know. I so often think I'm too far gone. But this verse tells me that I'm not. He's not giving up on us. So we can't give up on us. He's going to finish what he started. And I... I just, that verse has come to mean so much to me. His grace is always sufficient. Our mistakes are not bigger than his sovereignty and his grace. And I cling to that truth every single day. Um, so I, I hope that encourages you too, that he's, he's not, first of all, he's not finished with you yet. But secondly, he's not going to give up. He's going to finish that good work. And it's good. It is good. Verse 9, verses 9 through 11 are another favorite. And this is one of Paul's prayers. And I love to find prayers from the scripture and then turn them into prayers. Um, so I, and I also, for all of you longtime manlyites, I had to bring this and show you. I pulled out my study Bible that I don't use anymore. I mean, currently I don't use this daily. Um, but on verse 9, there, from a sermon from Pastor Emmert, June, actually 13th, it was this week, June 13th, 2009, he was preaching on this passage, and I love it so much because it still applies to us today as a church. It always will. But just thinking about his prayers for our church, and now the Lord even still answering those prayers for us, Ch uh, verse 9 says, um, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. And my little note from his sermon says, to love with insight. Isn't that good? Yes. And I just think turning this passage into a prayer for each other, for our church, Lord, may our love for one another abound more and more in knowledge, in discernment, that we may approve the things that are excellent. And so if you... Um, are ever unsure what to pray, which sometimes when I've been in dark seasons, I haven't known. Sometimes you don't have the words to pray. Open up your Bible. There are so many prayers here that you can make your own. And I love, love, love this one to pray for our church body. So that's um, verses 9 through 11, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and then it goes on to say... Um, So, uh, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So um, that will be fruitful. Pray that our, we'll love each other more. Pray that we'll have discernment, more knowledge of him, and pray that we'll be fruitful for Christ, righteous fruitfulness. I just love that. 
Um, then after we get through this initial greeting portion of the chapter, um, he starts talking. This is another. Oh, they're all my favorites. Uh, this is another favorite part of this chapter for me. Um, skip down. Well, you don't have to skip. Verses 12 through 14, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole Imperial Guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. So I want to camp here for just a minute. I love taking this verse and making it applicable to our own lives because we all have imprisonments or chains, um, trials, suffering, um, and if we allow him to, the Lord will use it to bring glory to his name and bring others to a saving knowledge of him. Just, I wanted to just take a minute and think back on your own life. It may be something in the past. It may be something current. Um, a trial that you faced where you can see how the Lord used that for his kingdom. And it may not be that you, you know, we compare ourselves to Paul and we think, well, no, God doesn't use me like that. But he does. He, you may have encouraged someone through your trial. You may have, your trial may have allowed you to see God in a new way. It may have allowed you to have a conversation with someone that you would never have had. You know, maybe you're at the hospital and you're able to talk to a nurse. Or maybe you're at, you know, wherever you're at, whatever your trial is, if we will allow him to the Lord will use it. And I also think it's interesting that Paul is not complaining. He's, he's, he's talking so much about gratitude and joy. And I think how likely is it, this was just very convicting for me, how likely is it that when I'm complaining about my trials, is that going to advance the kingdom? <laughs> so, and that's not to say, you know, we all, we all have our moments. I'm sure Paul had his moments. But, um, it was just very convicting for me to think about, you know, do I really want to share Jesus in my conversations? And when I'm, when I'm talking about the trials that I'm in or a trial from the past, um, just being open to how the Lord might use that in someone else's life. Um, and learning to see the good you know, so often I just tend to dwell on the negative aspect of whatever the situation is. And we're going to, there's a whole chapter, chapter four, there's a whole section we're going to talk about, there's a little sneak peek, um, about choosing our thoughts, you know, the passage, whatever is true, noble, lovely, right. We're going to talk about that. Um, so learning to choose to dwell on those things that are true has been such a huge life lesson for me, but it, but it takes practice. And I, I was thinking of all the heroes of the faith. Think, think of all the heroes of the faith that come to mind. And why are they heroes in, in our minds? Like They went through huge challenges and trials and suffering. And yet those are the people that we read about and that we look to as our heroes of the faith because they... They allowed those. They allowed God to use those trials in their lives. I mean, I was just was even thinking Noah. You know, they thought he was crazy, and thinking about um, even Mary. You know, she was so surrendered to the Lord's plan and said, "I'm your servant. May it be to you as according to your word." And she was willing. Um, so. That just really um, convicted me and reminded me um, that whatever trial I'm facing, he can use it for good. And so I actually, we're going to, um, we're going to have a little interaction here. I'm going to use this board. Um, so that, that verse is what? Verse 14 that says, um, what has happened to me is serve the gospel served to advance the gospel, and then verse um, 13, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. So, um, so I just wanted to, I would 
love for y'all to just make that personal and think for a minute and shout out some things that you know the Lord has used. It could be grief, loss, sickness. What has the Lord used, done in your life through trials and suffering? Um, and I just wanted to jot some of them down. If y'all, any of you are vulnerable enough to shout out. So Paul said, my imprisonment is for Christ. Depression. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking Lori would probably say, my stroke. Your stroke. Lori would probably say, my stroke. And she stroked and abused. And abused. Yeah. That, um, that's just very sobering for me. I don't know about you. Um, but to just think what God can do through your heartache and how he can use you to minister to someone else who is going through depression and miscarriage and divorce, if we'll let him, you know, if we will be open to that. So I just love making that verse applicable. Um, and so I just, if you're somebody that writes in your Bible, like I am, I have little notes all over my Bible, you could circle that phrase or just write out to the side. Um, you can write your own word in there as a reminder. And even as a prayer to ask the Lord, Lord, use this, use this that I hate, I'm going through this, but I know you can use this for your glory and to advance your kingdom. And that brings so much more meaning and purpose to what we're facing. So I wanted to look at um, another of Paul's letters where he wrote a little bit about suffering. I mean, he writes about it in a lot of um, his letters, but specifically, um, I was going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. So he wrote this a few years, no, he wrote Philippians a few years after this passage. And so he's, he's been through all of this, but he's still writing about joy, which... Once again, I'm very convicted. He says, um, let's see, which verse was I going to start in? About 23. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. 
who is weak, and I am not weak, who is made to fall, and I'm, so, yeah, uh, I think that's where I was going to stop. Anyway, that just, to me, was like this summary of, like, really, really hard things that he's been through, and then skip down to one of my favorite passages. This is what he says, you know, when he wrote letters, they weren't broken up into chapters, so this kind of all flowed together. So if you look down at um, 2 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 9, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect in your exhaustion, in your depression, in your anxiety, your disability, your heartaches, your trials. His power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness. I will allow the Lord to use them to further his kingdom so that the power of Christ may rest on me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insult, hardship, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It's almost like a mindset shift when you feel at your weakest to remember that's when really his strength makes us strong. He is our strength. And so it, it's almost just remembering in these moments of our trials, his grace is sufficient. We don't have to muster it up on our own. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Um, His grace is sufficient for every, you know, Paul was asking him to remove the thorn, right? How many of you have prayed way more than three times for God to remove something from your life? To fix it, to heal it, to restore it. And so we know Paul asked three times in that passage, and God didn't do it, did he? He didn't do it because it's for him, and he can use it to further his kingdom, and to bring him glory. And he didn't remove it, but he did something better. He gave him himself. He gave him grace, that sufficient grace that will get us through any of those um, situations. Okay, I don't know why I closed my Bible. Let's move on down to... Um, Verse 21 says, now I'm going to have to get a large print level. <laughs> uh, I think I've reached the age. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I don't mind to do it because I know it'll be easier, but I really hate, like I've got all my Bibles. I hate to start over. But, okay, so I'm reading from the ESV, and it says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Then I thought this was, I love, that's another thing I love to do, read a verse in multiple translations, and you just get, you just get this bigger, like, picture of it. So the New Living Translation of this verse says, for, to me, living means living for Christ. And dying is even better. <laughs> Isn't that so good? Dying is even better. So Paul is reminding us that if we're living for anything other than Christ, our life is going to end in loss instead of gain. If we are living for, I don't know about you, but I spent a lot of years of my life living for that next season. When I was in college, I was ready to get my job. When I got my first teaching job, I was ready. For, then I was ready to get married. And then I was waiting to have babies. And then I was ready. Is the next season? And if I, if I, I know it now. But if I'm not, I can tend to, you know. And now, y'all with little ones, now I'm in that next season. And don't, don't rush it, because your your quiet house is going to make you sad. Um, but when we when we live for that next season, that next season is going to pass away. It's going to fade away. If we're living for more money, more stability, a better job, 
Um, when we die, we leave all of that behind. If we're living for fame, one day we will be forgotten. So the only way to eternally gain in this life and the next is for Christ to be our life. To live is Christ. Because when we leave this earthly home we are currently in, then we get more of Jesus. So dying is better, like that translation said, because we will get more, we will get all of Jesus that we want all the time. So in this life, instead of the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of Christ is what will lead us to contentment and joy. And so as I was reading this, I just asked the Lord to search my heart. And that, this is another very convicting thing for me. Um, but just think through, I'm not going to ask you to shout this one out because this one's even more vulnerable than the first one. If you were to fill in the blank, for me to live is blank. What would you put in that blank? I know for some of us, for me to live is my kids, my job, my home, my relationships. Maybe it's healing. Maybe it's reconciliation. Um, for me to live is blank. And if it's anything other than Jesus, it's going to lead to, and those aren't bad things. Your kids, your home, whatever. Those are gifts from God. But when the gifts become more important than the giver, we've lost our, um, got our priorities out of whack. And it's going to lead to disappointment. Those people in our lives will always disappoint us. The job, the house, the money. But Jesus, Jesus doesn't disappoint and he's the only thing in this life that won't disappoint. Okay, I'm going to read a little um, snippet from this book. I'm almost done. Almost to the end of my notes. Okay, um, it says, Even as Christians, many of us are still caught on the American dream treadmill of pursuing happiness. Our minds are still programmed to think that lasting joy is out there, just waiting for us when we buy that new car or that new home or whatever that next thing is you're hoping for. Honestly, does that describe you? Do you often find yourself thinking how good life would be if you only had X, Y, Z? We spend far more time than any of us likes to admit window shopping for joy while dressed in drab attitudes, but it's true. And we've always got excuses, even though we prefer to label them as reasons why we're not happy. If I only had this, or if only he would do that. If only. If only means our, our eyes are on the horizon, still searching, waiting for our ship to come in so we can be joyful. How would you like to quit waiting? How would you like to exchange those worn out, melancholy attitudes you're wearing for joy? And then he quotes Dr. Larry Crabb from a book. Many of us place top priority not on becoming Christ-like in the middle of our problems, but on finding happiness. I want to be happy, but the paradoxical truth is that I will never be happy if I'm concerned primarily with becoming happy. <laughs> My overriding goal must be in every circumstance to respond biblically, to put the Lord first, to seek to behave as he would want me to. The wonderful truth is that as we devote all our energies to the task of becoming what Christ wants us to be, he fills us with joy then, unspeakable, and gives us a peace far surpassing what the world could ever offer you. Paul said it was his ambition, his goal, not to become happy, but to please God at every moment. What a transforming thought. When I drive my car to work and someone cuts me off, when my kids act crazy, when the dishwasher breaks, when someone gets sick, my primary responsibility is to please God. As Jesus said, we can't serve two masters, for we'll always end up hating one and loving the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Is happiness your mammon? Is pleasing God second or third or fourth to becoming happy? There's only one way to free yourself from the tyranny of the pursuit of happiness and find true joy, and that's by making your goal to please God instead. And then it just offers this question, in what practical ways this week can you build up and encourage and reinforce the mindset of pleasing Christ? 
I have a, that's another one that I would write down. And I, I like to write things on index cards and put them all over my house because I have a bad memory and I don't remember, but I've, I've just been convicted by this. And so I'll put it on my house, put it on a timer on my phone. That's another thing to set off and remind me. So how can I please God in this moment with this situation that I don't really like? How can I please him through it? How can he use my trials for his glory? And I just want to close with um, John 10, 10, a verse that I'm sure you all know. But if we're always, it just reminded me of this verse as I was reading through this today. If we're always looking for what's next in life, we will never have that true joy that Jesus came to give us. He came to give us what? Abundant life, as we read in John 10.10. 10. But that abundant life is through him. It's not through that relationship. Through It's not even through the good things that God gives us. That abundant life is through him. And... Those things we hope for, they aren't bad. They're gifts from God, but we can't, we can't find our joy in them because tomorrow they may be gone. Um, but finding joy in Jesus for all of eternity is abundant life. Um, John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal. The thief is the one, the enemy is trying to get us to think about Oh, I just need this, and then I'll be happy. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So finding that joy in Jesus for all of eternity and that abundant life is him. To live is Christ, which is what Paul is talking about back in that verse in chapter 1. So I hope that, I hope that encourages you, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pray for us as we finish up. Oh God, there are so many truths here that I just, I didn't adequately <laughs> go through all of them, Lord. But I just pray that um, you would continue to search our hearts, that we would allow you to search our hearts. And we know that we have the Holy Spirit living within us who can fix us. And Lord, show us, show us where we're looking for joy or ha whatever you want to call it, happiness, joy in all the wrong places, Lord. That true joy, that lasting joy, that abundant life joy can only come through you. And so, God, we bring before you tonight all of these things we've listed on the board and the ones we haven't said out loud. God, you know the cries of our hearts for our children for our marriages, for our homes, our financial situations, our sickness. Lord, you, you know each and every need that's in this room. And I thank you that you're near to the brokenhearted. And I thank you that you want to use those things for your glory and to advance the kingdom. I pray that you would give us that mindset, Lord, that when we're having those conversations, and we're talking about whatever it is we're going through, Lord. Help us to remember that you can use that conversation to draw someone to you, to encourage someone, to comfort someone. Lord, so we just humbly come before you tonight and ask you to use us. Use the trial in our life, whether it was last year or whether it's today, to encourage someone else, to draw them to you to advance your kingdom. And you're going to receive all the glory for that, Lord. And I thank you so much for each and every lady that's here tonight. And I just pray that you would encourage her heart as only you can through your word and through time spent with you. And I pray all of this in your name. Amen.